Howard, you seem to be bl dark. Have you got your video working, my friend? I do have it working. I'm simply covering it with a security measure. There you are. Oh, okay, fantastic. Excellent. I like your beard, pal. You've got all kind of like rustic and... Yeah, yeah it's, you know... Back. Yeah? Distinguished, I think, is the word you're looking for, right? And, and I suppose this time you haven't you haven't managed to organise for the uh, the new New York police to go past like you did last time. I know, yeah, I know. I'm actually in the bucolic surroundings of headquarters in Armour. It's actually less than five percent. So in all, all the mid office and back office applications, which is actually is what the banks run on, as opposed to front office HTML, CSS, programming languages. Yeah, five percent of those types of workloads have moved. So uh, Howard, are you good? Ready to go? Yeah. Villa, you good and ready to go? Okay, in that case, let's get going. Welcome to FinTech Daydreaming. The podcast that dives into the world of banking technologies and the ever-changing landscape of FinTech companies. We bring you real life examples from global and local thought leaders, as well as experts working within the financial industry and seek out the best stories from the front lines of financial services innovation, where dreams of industry pioneers meet reality. Hosted by Paul Krogdahl and Ville Sontu. This is Fintech Daydreaming. We're back guys. Another episode of uh, Fintech Daydreaming brought to you by myself, Paul Krogdahl, and my um, partner in fintech uh, my fantastic good friend villa with a new job and uh, way too much traveling but this time you're sitting at home for a change yeah How for a change, I'm, for a change. I'm, good. I'm good i'm good last episode we did was in uh, in india but uh, now i'm in this exotic place called espo finland which is of course uh, always nice to be in but i do have to say that this is a fairly late recording we're doing i guess this is like a late night show uh, version that we're doing uh, due to the time differences uh, that we have between us uh, uh, with the guest uh, today. But uh, yeah. Which means we're past the, the watershed, so we can swear if we want to, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> the kids are sleeping. And actually, I'm usually sleeping at this time as well, but not that I'm complaining. Uh, anyway. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I think it's it's for all good reasons for us to be up this late, because we've got none other than Howard Boville back with us on yeah, the the podcast, and, and it's fantastic to have you here with us, Howard. It's um, I think it was season one when you joined us uh, the first time, and an awful lot of us happened since then, uh, both you know in the world of cloud and for us here at fintech daydreaming. But for you know one or two few people out there in the the banking and fintech world who maybe doesn't know who Howard Beauville is, do you want to sort of just quickly introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah, well, first and foremost, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't know who I am. So let me give you kind of a, a pen picture to explain who I am. So um, I lead the hybrid cloud platform here at IBM and, and part of the executive uh, leadership team. <clears throat> I joined IBM at the height of the pandemic uh, in May 2020. So that was only two months after the world locked down. Um, so therefore a pandemic hire at IBM. And it feels like I'm joining the company again because actually I'm now getting to travel and meet with people. Um, Prior to that, um, I was the chief technology officer at Bank of America um, and led their technology across all of their lines of business. And that's what serendipitously has got me into this role here at IBM, because I felt back then, as I now know is true, that there was a need um, for a specialist industry cloud provider that addressed the needs of um, the regulated industries, so federal financial services, telecommunications and health. And whilst that was a, an idea that I had at B of A two years since I've joined now, we have a very strong and thriving business servicing that market need. Absolutely. And when you joined us the first time, it was very fairly early on in that journey of IBM's financial services cloud. And a lot has changed since then. But I mean, what about if we just sort of quickly look across the board? What are the current trends we're seeing in regards to banks and modernizing and and moving towards the cloud. Is it really going fast or is it a slow, painful journey? <laughs> the, uh, well, let me, before I dive into the specifics on that, let me kind of kind of go through, I guess, what's changed since we last spoke. So I, so I joined in May, 2020, but Arvind Krishna, our chief executive, became chief executive in April, 2020, and declared that the strategy for the company would be hybrid cloud, hybrid multi-cloud. And whilst two years is only a short time, but two years ago, 
there was a view, a dogmatic view, that the world would go to, everything would go to the cloud and it would be a singular cloud. Hmm. And when Arvind declared the strategy of IBM, because of the IBM brand, it gave all of these CIOs that knew that wasn't the case, a sigh of relief to say, okay, if IBM can support this, I can actually now speak more openly about the fact that the world will still be on-premise in terms of I have things in my own data center. It will be in the cloud, but not a singular cloud provider. It will be multiple cloud providers because I want to draw down upon the innovation as a CIO from any institution from the points of innovation those multiple cloud providers provide. And increasingly, it will be software as a service providers that I actually assemble to actually enable the business processes that I have. Um, so that's actually really liberated people's thinking and actually really then got after what the true value of technology is and in this current technology wave that we live within, which is hybrid multi-cloud, it is about the continued transformation of business processes and how you do that with the latest technology tools. This whole notion that cloud is a strategy in and of itself was a false hope and a false dream. It is a component and we play a very strong part in that. And hopefully we can talk a little bit about that as the interview goes. In the case of financial services, less than 5% of the mission critical workloads have moved to any cloud architecture um, in a public context. Um, the ones that have typically moved to our cloud because of the way that we have built it. Um, in the front office applications, it's probably about 30 or 40%. So the easier to move workloads, so HTML, CSS, but that doesn't give you any real benefit as a business. It's simply moving workloads off your Linux servers, Red Hat Linux servers and your own data centers onto Red Hat Linux servers and somebody else's data centers. What we're more interested in with the rich array of capabilities that we have, including the IBM cloud for regulated industries, is to help you transform your business in a way that actually has a discernible difference to your balance sheet, um, either through growth or through cost reduction or through delivery and operating and leverage by doing both. Well, I mean, you mentioned onto a, a critical point there, which, which is about, you know, the cost, et cetera. One of the discussions that I end up having quite often with, with, with banks around moving to cloud, they tend to say, yeah, well, we did a POC, we moved some workloads to the cloud and, and the cost actually went up rather than down. Aren't they measuring it in the wrong way? Well, well firstly, the, they're with a the general purpose cloud providers, what they are saying there is correct. If, if you're building a general purpose cloud, you can't drive to the levels of economy in terms of your cost base and therefore their cost going up is, is, is absolutely likely to be the case more often than not with the general purpose cloud providers. Our cloud isn't the general purpose cloud. It's built with the SKUs, the workloads um, for the industries that we serve. So we know that economically, and this may sound like a strange thing for a brand like IBM to be associated with, but think of IBM as a two-year-old company, not a 111-year-old company, because we pivoted under the, the new leadership of Marvin back in April 2020, um, is because we've been very measured in how we built our capability Cost is a benefit with IBM Cloud relative to other providers. But to your point, that isn't what moving to a cloud is or a cloud architecture. Um, it is about actually how you can help decalcify business processes that have become calcified over a period of time by actually rethinking about how you place workloads, applications, the associated data sets, how you draw upon the points of innovation, but in a very open way. The philosophy that we have here at IBM is one that is the architecture, the technical architecture that should come before actually any particular technology um, or even any partner. And from a customer perspective, we should be giving you the most open range of choices that you can. And to help with that, the acquisition of Red Hat um, and particularly open um, shift, shift, we allow you to actually build one sooner and anywhere. Um, and by doing that, you can actually ensure that not only will you be doing a business transformation in a digital context that gives you competitive advantage, but you will be doing so in a sustainable way um, so that actually the decisions that you make now, the daydreams that you have now, will actually not become nightmares in the future. Sustainability is actually a really critically important part these days, particularly around the banks. Right? I mean, we're talking about sustainable investments. We're talking about sustainable business. Does cloud actually help a bank to be more sustainable than running things on premise? If done correctly from an architectural perspective, it does. If it doesn't, if it isn't done correctly, it does more, more problems in terms of hmm. the sustainability of the decision, but following the word sustainability all through all the way through to environmental sustainability and governance hmm. from a carbon perspective, um, it can be very inefficient. But the way that we deliver is we will, um, as a cloud provider, be the only cloud provider that will give your applications, the, the most appropriate home for them to run, whether that's 
the silicon called x86, which is the thing that you have in your laptop or your PC, mm -hmm. the types of silicon that you have in the more industrial enterprise grid platforms that we have, such as power and our Z platform and our Linux one platform that runs on Z. And then also we're the only cloud provider to also then offer quantum, real quantum in our environment, um, all abstracted so that you can use them in the most contemporary way from a development perspective. The interesting thing with the, the, the Z platform, our mainframe platform, um, is very often it gets kind of labeled with all technology. And the, the truth is, could not be further from that position. It's the most contemporary cloud-based architecture that exists. Um, it offers, it operates at seven nines of availability, which is very, very high grade and exactly what's required in an age when customers want instant gratification. And therefore any amount of downtime is not acceptable and can damage the reputation of customers if they don't have that. But to your point around the actual carbon neutrality, we've already modeled and looked at kind of core business processes in our customers and running your, your workloads on the Z platform whilst also eat more economic is six times less um, draining upon carbon emissions, a factor of six. So anti-money laundering, which is a, a, a series of applications um, ran by all financial institutions from a regulatory perspective, we've modeled what it would be to run those on x86 and on the mainframe. It is six times less um, uh, carbon, carbon emitting than what it is to run the, uh, the, the um, on x86. In addition to that, it takes around eight times less footprint in a physical data center. So you, you get so much more benefit with this far more advanced technology um, for your workloads. And it's really important for us as kind of this new IBM um, as a hybrid multi-cloud business to ensure that we cast this new light on technology that is very contemporary that perhaps in the past was actually labeled as being all technology where in reality it's not at all. So does that mean that clients can actually run mainframe in the cloud? Yes. Yeah. So we, we continue to build upon that capability. So we have a capability called WASI. I am told by my marketing colleagues, it um, is Swahili um, for open. Now I'm okay. sure people will now be Googling that. And I actually wish I Googled it before I said it. Because actually, <laughs> that in my marketing co colleagues may have been winding me up. Um, but it allows you to actually develop against the mainframe in contemporary languages. So Linux one. So from a developer perspective, you don't have to be developing against COBOL or machine uh, learning code. You actually just do it against the actual platform itself. And then it can run it in different environments. Because the other important element that many of your listeners will understand is you don't run things singularly on one platform. You think more about your business processes. That is a cluster of different applications and third-party software. Some of those will run x86 because that's appropriate for that type of workload. Others will run on power. Others will run on mainframe. And the combination of those compute platforms and the applications is what actually gives life to your business processes. If you architect that, for cor that correctly, you can really do some wonderful things in terms of how you differentiate in the marketplace. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting. We're, we're talking about this wonderful, fantastic, modern way of running workloads. We're talking about an awful lot of flexibility. So as banks are modernizing, what's the sort of main barriers to execution of all of this? Is it regulations, technology, business focus? What's, what's hindering them if we're talking about only 5% has been moved to cloud? All of the above and, and, and many, many more. The, um, so because it's kind of a whole range of different kind of technology adoption as you kind of have on this classic kind of, you get kind of the early adopters it then goes through in terms of kind of the trough of disillusionment and it kind of bounces back again. And what I would say is that cloud adoption is still a very nascent area, still a very new area in terms of being used appropriately. Um, cloud has got another 20 to 30 years to, to run for it to continue to mature. It's already been going for 14 years if you go back to the very beginnings of AWS. The IBM cloud is actually a very relatively new entrance. We've been in business for two years um, in terms of what we deliver in the marketplace. So when I talk to customers in terms of where they are on their journeys, they can be kind of categorized in a number of areas. They're early adopters that have experimented with different bits and pieces of cloud offerings from maybe from multiple cloud providers, but simply looked at moving workloads, but with no real architectural thought in terms of the technical architectures they put in place and certainly no real thought process in terms of what the business value is. And they're in this kind of Frankenstein's monster, this Franken cloud situation where they have stitched together lots of piece parts and all that's gonna get them to is cost overrun, IT operational inefficiency and cybersecurity risk. Um, just a question of when that powder keg will actually explode and those problems will happen. Um, 
but every new technology requires early adopters for these lessons to be learned and then they will pull back and then move forward again for those institutions that haven't moved forward and that's the large proportion the largest proportion as the actual numbers would indicate in terms of five percent adoption in the mid office and back office space are actually starting to understand the importance of what's the business imperative that we're looking to deliver here what's the architecture that i need i absolutely cannot be wedded to a singular cloud provider i have to take multiple cloud providers because i don't want a concentration risk where if a cloud provider has a bad day in the office and they go down that then brings my entire business down so how do you think about that architectural piece that you put in place how do you think about day two management once you have this new environment of where you're running your workloads so this whole thing called oss your operational service support model um, and then how do you think about um, the things such as cybersecurity? How do you think about laws, rules, and regulations as a regulated industry that you have to adhere to? What we have done, the nice thing that we have built within our platform is we've built all of those capabilities in from the outset. With the other cloud providers, you as a customer, a bank, you have to build those controls into your platform. Um, and every single institution has to do it at their expense and they have to pay for it at their expense. I didn't think that was a good idea when I worked in banking and that's why I built this platform that has all of the laws, rules and regulations on a global basis built in from the outset. In addition to that, we then give you a console whereby you can see that you're in continuous adherence to that. And what that also then means is that actually you're benefiting from the community that we have created. Um, and I'm happy to expand a little bit on the community, but I don't want to go too far off the questions that you're asking Pal, as you go through this. Yeah, no, that's that's fine. I think Villa, you had you had an interesting question on your mind. Yeah, I, I actually have a new one that just occurred to me. I'm gonna kind of come back to your previous question, Paul, which was the uh, what are the barriers of entry? Again, regulation being the usual suspect of uh, of uh, well, we can't do this because of regulation. Now, I'm I mean I'm a I'm a recovering banker myself, and I've been on that side of the fence many times. And again, whenever we talked about cloud. Somebody said, well, we can't do X, Y, Z because of regulation. Is that still true, Howard, in the conversations you're having uh, on the kind of executive levels of bank? Do they actually still blame regulation as a, as a barrier of entry for, uh, for cloud? And if they do, is there a specific regulation around this? Or is it more about the perception of being compliant with the broader risk controls? It, it changes around the world, but it certainly isn't a situation where a regulator will say thou shalt not. So in the past, that has been put up as an excuse when actually that wasn't the reality. Um, it does make it a little bit harder because in certain regulatory jurisdictions, you do need to go through, quite rightly, more um, evidence to demonstrate you're making the right directions. Um, in in, in uh, other areas, they may certain regulators will say that you, you cannot have one cloud provider, you have to have another cloud provider. Whereas in other regulatory jurisdictions, it isn't as prescriptive as that. But if you're a global bank, you actually have to be aware of what the actual prescriptive direction is in each of the jurisdictions that you operate within and ensure that you adhere to it. So just from that brief explanation of kind of the variability of what you're required to do based upon where you're operating means that you do have to really be thoughtful as to how you put the, the architecture together. You can't just stumble into it and then subsequently find out through what's known as a regulatory examination by a regulator that you fall and foul from direction that they provided. Um, that is possible to do because actually it's a very dynamic environment. Things change all the time. And how we are different is we build those controls into our platform from the outset and we update them on a monthly basis. We take the, the laws, rules and regs and we turn them into software. Um, the, we don't dream up what those are. So we take them from the various regulatory issuances that come out by each of the regulators around the world. But we also have a very vibrant um, financial services community that give us their control frameworks that we turn into software. And when we last spoke, and it was only two years ago, we had eight banks in that um, financial services community, um, eight large banks, what's known as global systemic risk banks. We worked with the biggest banks first to actually go through their control frameworks because typically they have the most regulatory oversight. But since we've last spoken, um, we now have 120 banks, one, two, zero, actively involved in the community. We do financial services councils practically every week now with an audience of around 12 to 15 to keep it manageable. But we're now actually starting to do face-to-face -face conferences. We've got one coming up um, in the UK at the end of December where we have around 100 banks in attendance there. So you can see very quickly the interest from having eight banks to 120 
And the mission that we had for this business wasn't to create this big community, but because the problem we're solving for is actually a well understood problem and we are unique in what we're doing, it's naturally caused this kind of network effect of different institutions around the world wanting to be involved. Yeah, that actually gives me an interesting segue uh, into my next question, which is uh, related to the multi-cloud strategies that we're seeing. Because when I was working for a regional bank, uh, again, uh, the cloud infrastructure works great. We know exactly what the regulations are. We know that we need to keep certain parts of the data inside the uh, uh, country borders and so forth and so forth. Everything was pretty clear from, from that perspective. But now I've switch to a job which is more of a global service company so we are uh, we are effectively uh, doing regulated services as a platform provider as a service now this brings an interesting dilemma of course because we cannot really say that we will use cloud x only globally uh, because that would restrict ourselves uh, both from a regulatory standpoint and of course the uh, uh, the, uh, the availability standpoint uh, in some instances especially when talking about emerging markets so that brings us to the, to the question of, of multi-cloud. And I, I, know, I know this might kind of be a little bit counterintuitive uh, being a cloud provider yourself, but I mean, uh, multi-cloud is important. Uh, you, there should be an architecture that allows you to deploy across a, a, typically the cloud that is best for the occasion for that specific area, for that specific customer, uh, uh, and still be able to run with a fairly uniform uh, architecture and software structure. So, uh, uh, Having done this for a while, I think it's it's actually still quite difficult, especially if you're really going cloud native, uh, then it's it's practically, well, it's really, really hard. But is IBM doing anything better here than any of the other cloud vendors? Uh, not naming any other names, of course, uh, in context of this conversation, but let's say doing, doing a cloud native approach for multi-cloud uh, is in general quite hard. Uh, is, yes. is IBM doing anything different here? We are doing something different. The, um... And it, 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 the thing I love about these kind of calls is it gives me the opportunity to kind of get beyond the high level heuristic, the high level label you get, so you can actually better get people to understand actually the proposition that we have. So I, I run a, I'm a hyperscale or I run a hyperscale business in terms of all of the um, scores of data center, centers I have around the world, all of the kind of the service catalog, catalog I have and so on and so forth. But I don't see myself being a competitor to Alibaba, GCP, Azure, AWS, because the way I would have bought in my old role is the way that I have built the platform and it's the way I envisage the actual cloud industry to actually continue to build out, which is there will be specialist providers that have built the capabilities within their data centers to actually take the needs of the actual applications, their attributes, their characteristics, the risk posture and so on. And that's where we play. Whereas in the front office applications, Azure is world-class there, AWS is good there. So there's, there's an adjacency in terms of how we would operate. The, the second element I would make as well is, again, as a previous buyer, I didn't want to be locked out of, not locked in, locked out of the innovation that I'd want to take from different cloud providers. I could see that each cloud provider was starting to differentiate in different ways. And therefore, having a, a lock into a particular cloud provider, you have obviously all, all the obvious things, which is you can get gouged for pricing and so on. It's important that you architect in such a way that you are not locked out of the innovation. So you're actually sat in a particular stack. There's things you want, but you can't get at it because actually you're locked in. And that locked in ties to that point you mentioned on cloud native. Um, in my old role at Bank of America, I did not build natively into the native Kubernetes version of the cloud providers. I built an abstraction um, and, I'm, I'm, and I built it on OpenShift. I'm now at the company that acquired OpenShift because I wanted that degree of separation on my control plane from the different cloud provider pools that I have. Not because I wanted to move away from different cloud providers, but because I wanted to be able to consume services from all of them. So I built that capability internally. And that's, I would really push and always do push when I'm talking to customers, you've got to have that point of abstraction so that you're not locked out, locked out of innovation. But then the final point, um, which again, I kind of could see when I was thinking about what kind of business we would build here in terms of the products we have, is um, the, the, the world of um, telecommunications is very similar to the way where the cloud is going to play out. There are 60 companies in the world that provide telecommunications that have got $10 billion plus of revenue. Now, why are there 60 when there are currently five or six cloud providers? There are 60 for a number of reasons. The first reason is because of the amount of capital that you need to spend to build telecommunications infrastructure. It is no different for cloud. 
And there isn't a single technology company in the world with the balance sheet that can build the amount of kilowatt capability to meet the needs. So there is six of us now in terms of in the cloud space, there'll be easily 20 in five years time. The other reason for that is regulations. And regulations is, is actually moving, particularly as it relates to data privacy on this notion of data sovereignty is that the data needs to reside in the country of the citizens where that data is captured, both in terms of the physical way, in terms of the, the people that work upon that data. And there's legislation that's being proposed, proposed in certain countries that the actual legal entity that owns the data center has to be owned by the nation. The company needs to be a limited company or a listed company that's owned by that nation. So from the very outset, from when we started this business two years ago, we have built capabilities that is on hybrid multi-cloud. Uh, and we do that with an offering called Satellite. Why is it called Satellite? This is where marketing got it really good because satellites sit above the clouds. Um, and Satellite sits above all of the different clouds, ours included, and it gives you that abstraction capability, runtime, uh, databases, and so on, so you're not locked into the different cloud providers. It gives you that laws, rules, and regulations capability that I've talked about. So you can drop it into your on-premise environments. You can drop it on AWS, Azure, GCP, Alibaba, Equinox, whoever the in-country provider is, and ensure that you're actually future ready for when the regulations do come through, or you want to ensure that there's a data gravity issue that you address there as well. Essentially, the fun thing about this job is I'm building all the things that I wanted when I was a chief technology officer at Bank of America that didn't exist in the marketplace. And because philosophically, I don't see myself competing against the other providers, uh, the other ca the category king and the general purpose cloud providers, I actually am relaxed about how I actually integrate into them. If your mission in life, if you're a general purpose cloud provider when you get out of bed, is to eviscerate your competition, it means you think very diff differently about how you develop products and capabilities. Whereas I, that isn't my plan. Mine's to integrate, collaborate, and um, you, you generate far more kind of um, health and well-being by having peace treaties as opposed to um, acts of war. So I feel like that's the right strategy that we have here. Yeah, and I, I can actually let me re-ask the question a little, from a little bit different perspective. So when we are talking about this, uh, I mean, I then Villa Rose, or is it you got sorry, to, you sorry, <laughs> to, uh, talking about virtual and cloud native? So what do you think? You know, a lot of, a lot of companies do want to be built cloud native, uh, and you're saying that this uh, hybrid multi-cloud is, is so of course. Uh, architecture more sound proposition, but what are the kind of main arguments that you hear for cloud native uh, implementations? It's just easier. It's kind of the, it's the easy button. Um, you say, okay, well, I can get my developers trade up on general purpose cloud provider here. They've got the skills because they've got online and they can build on um, the cloud native stuff. That for me presented a number of problems when I was a practitioner and is a practitioner now. The first problem is, when you're a CIO, a key thing that you're always looking to do is to get the optimized use of all of the IT resources you have. Excellent. So build a smaller number of SKUs for your applications to run upon and have a smaller number of the DevSecOps tool chain, if, if, if possible, get to one for your developers to develop against. The more different tool chains that they develop against, the less homo homogenous behavior, more more productivity you can get from your developers because they're locked into the actual tool chains they've got. So you're looking to drive that. If you allow your developers to develop against general purpose cloud provider one, general purpose cloud provider two, you've then created two tribes because they're going natively against the actual tool chains of those stacks. So you've immediately prevented yourself from getting any ability to get good productivity from your development community. Um, you've also then introduced IT complexity because how do you actually put a consistent level of controls in place when you're using inconsistent DevSecOps tool chains, because it's at the DevSecOps tool chains where you actually insert the actual levels of policy that you need to. And that's increasingly understood to be a problem now, particularly as it was kind of put into the public domain through the executive order that President Biden issued a few months back, few months back on the software bill of materials. Um, so developing natively against multiple cloud providers is where uh, ruin exists in terms of what it, where it ultimately takes you. You've got to abstract across those different areas. When you consume electricity from an electricity provider, it isn't a different type of voltage that you get, um, or, the, or it's a different appliance in your home that you plug into it because it's from a different provider. Um, and again, the analogy is in telecommunications. Telecommunications has to have standards 
in order for data to be able to traverse the world. And that's a key element that's put in place. You've got companies that compete against each other, but they work to the same set of standards, not their native capabilities. Um, and that's this needs to be the same and will be the same as cloud continues to mature. That's why I still feel we're a very nascent area. It has to be driven by customers because if you're a general purpose cloud provider, you rub your hands with glee when they actually say, okay, well, we'll develop natively against your platform. That's it. You're never leaving us, right? You're going to be chained to Radiator forever. So um, th thank you for, for that. You've got to take the right architectural decisions. Otherwise, you're building a house of cards. And I think we've actually seen quite recently examples of where locking yourself into one provider has actually created a, a higher level of risk uh, when there's been outages or, or uh, other issues, right? It's, it's even large uh, organizations like Facebook were hit by that quite recently. So I think that adds to the discussion of why cloud native maybe isn't always the best idea. I mean, and it, it, all the time, it's a lot, the Q4 of last year, the whole Eastern seaboard of North America was more or less taken down because many, many companies were singularly tied entirely to a particular cloud provider, a singular cloud provider, mm -hmm. um, and that caused issues. Now, what I would say as well, and this is a really important point, I am in no way um, knocking cloud providers for their service availability because essentially all they're doing is what every CIO that still has their own data center infrastructure on is doing, which is they run their own data centers. And there are three golden rules when it comes to service availability, which is that hardware will always fail, software will always have bugs, and technicians will always push keys at you rather they didn't in their change procedures that cause problems. Mm -hmm. And as a CIO, you're forever working through how you can actually get that to be mitigated as best as possible. And therefore, all companies that run data centers, whether it's an enterprise or whether it's a cloud provider like IBM or other cloud providers, will have situations where problems arise. But by thinking about how you can architect that, where you mitigate the concentration risk, and what I mean by concentration risk is not just having all of your eggs in one basket, all of your workloads in one data center, in the same way as you wouldn't do that um, in your own environments. And that even applies when you're working with multi-zone areas. Um, can help you actually get from three nine availability up to four nines, five nines, and then to high levels of availability. And as I mentioned, with some of the platforms that we have here in IBM, the mainframe that runs at seven nines of availability, oh. highest availability platform that you can buy. There is a um, sort of steady growth of industry specific cloud offerings coming out that we're seeing. I mean, do you think we're going to start to see a focused shift to industry cloud verticals away from generic public cloud? Well, first and foremost, what I would say is that imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. Mm. So we're delighted that when IBM created this new category of industry clouds back in May 2020, there have been many imitators thereafter. Um, I'm also delighted to say that actually um, all of the stuff that I see is architecture as opposed to true technical architecture. Um, it's kind of repurposing things to make it look like an industry cloud, when in reality, it simply isn't. Um, but I think over time, when the various development teams and different cloud providers have the opportunity to take the length of time to run it as we have at IBM, um, you will start to see more specific offerings being put together. And not just by the big six cloud providers, five cloud providers ex ex exist now. As I said, it will be in-country providers that put together specialist offerings for their nation state or whatever else. The good thing that we have here at IBM is then we have satellite that can help you give a consistent approach in terms of how you run those, those things from a day two perspective going forward. But ab absolutely, there will continue to be further specialization um, to meet the specific needs of particular types of workloads or particular industries. And, and from a, a enterprise perspective, do you think that the shift towards uh, industry vertical clouds is gonna become more specific and, and relevant than generic? Clouds? Yeah, and, and, so, and for kind of one very simple reason, which is um, the world continues to increase at an exponential rate to be digital. And to do that, it means that the number of transactions that are taking place and interactions that are taking place on digital platforms require a huge amount of CPU and memory horsepower. Um, and you either build out horizontally lots and lots and lots of x86, or you start to use x86 and other platforms that are best suited for the for those particular kind of jobs. Um, and therefore that's just a natural thing that's gonna happen because the actual huge volumes that go through um, anybody's digital channels or anybody's processing capabilities, whether it's digital payments right through to actually call centers or actual online premise.
I've, I've got a question I, I want to ask you, Howard, and all, all our listeners know that I have an IBM just like you. So this this might be a, a question that ends up with, with you slapping around the head after we turn off the cameras. But I'd, I'd like to sort of put together some of the points that we've discussed. I mean, we're talking about IBM was the first to come out with a an industry focused regulated cloud, the IBM FS cloud. We're also talking at the same time about the fact that, you know, we IBM is promoting and saying that the future is hybrid cloud. On the one side, we're saying we've got an offering very unique and special to IBM. Come and put your workloads in here. But at the same time, you should be running your workloads in a hybrid multi-cloud world. Isn't that, there's a dichotomy there almost. So, so what's the answer here between IBM FS cloud, but hybrid multi-cloud? Yeah, it, it may feel that way, but it's, it's really, really straightforward. Um, you, you, your cloud strategy shouldn't be a cloud strategy. You should have a workload placement strategy, uh, which you would do and you do do if you run your own data centers. When you look at your various workloads and you look at the attributes and characteristics of those workloads, so as I mentioned, what CPU, what memory, whatever else it needs and what its risk posture is, you make a decision in terms of the SKUs that you build out and put on the floor in your own data centers and you make a decision as to where you place them. Hmm. You then take a high level view of the service chaining to say, okay, what business processes is that supporting and what do I need to do on those business processes? Is it one that isn't actually having got massive increasing demand or is it going to continue to build out and so on and so forth? And you just simply think about it in those terms. And when you think about it in the workload placement term, you end up making the right decisions as to where those, where those workloads should sit. I hear you know, all the time about kind of we're moving everything to the cloud or we've got this get off the mainframe um, uh, strategy. I, I don't actually even understand what that means because actually, okay, well, what's the business value you're going to deliver? Why have you made that decision? Uh, other than it seems like a fashionable thing to say. Um, it's got to be what's the workloads, where should they land and what's going to be the most appropriate environment for them to land? So, I mean, the, kind, of get to, kind of give brands, you can say, okay, there's an architecture that works to say from a data gravity perspective, you want to keep certain data in your own data centers. You know that the size of that data center footprint is going to reduce down because there's other workloads that will go to a third party public cloud provider. So work through what the end state of your on-premise elements need to be based upon the reasons why you're making those correct decisions, data gravity, data sovereignty, whatever it may be. Then if the workloads you move out, if it's front office applications, um, move it to Azure. If you're working with an enterprise company, I actually would have always thought that Azure is the right decision for systems of engagement in the front office space because also they're an enterprise company and they understand what it is to operate in the enterprise space. If it's your mid office applications and your back office applications that need high levels of availability, performance, capacity, high levels of security, all the laws, rules and regulations that I talked about, then they, they should absolutely live on the IBM cloud because we've built for that capability. Um, and then the final point I would make is that, again, this is an increasing trend. More and more companies now build less and less and write less and less lines of code for their own applications. And what they do is actually piece part lots to get lots of SaaS offerings together. Um, and again, that was a, a problem statement that I could see in my old rule that I built the capability for here because to get at that innovation where increasingly your business processes are a, 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 a well thought through interchangeable quilt of different software providers, you need them to land on a platform that will ensure that you're not introducing fourth party risk into their third party area. And uh, it could be another whole episode to talk more detail about that. I can certainly touch upon it on a lighter basis in this conversation, but we built a platform where we can mitigate and give you visibility around third and fourth party risk. Something that wasn't even thought about to any great extent until solar winds happened. Um, but increasingly, that's the aperture by which threat actors actually get a point of insertion into enterprises. We built a platform for that. It's not just a marketplace that we have. Think about it as a marketplace with high levels of hygiene. If you go to a meat market or to a fish market, we've got all of those controls built in from the outset so that you know that what you are consuming is not going to give you um, um, any, any issues in a negative con a connotation afterwards. Fantastic. I don't know, we're starting to rapidly run out of time here. And, and like all good, fantastic discussions, they do move quite fast. I don't know, Villa, do you have any last questions before we sum up? Yeah, well, maybe one. And this is maybe a little bit out of the script that, uh, that we talked about before. But I do have to ask, because many times, I mean, again, this is true for all cloud providers, generic ones and uh, whatever you work in the cloud, is that 
you do a fantastic job in implementing your cloud architecture. You do everything correctly. And then you make one small configuration error, and then you get 10x invoice at the end of the month from your cloud provider. Uh, this is a, a usual joke in the uh, in the industry that, uh, again, all you need to do is uh, pu push one lever, uh, one software is running that shouldn't be running, and then you get a 100,000 euro invoice uh, in the mail. Or is, is anything getting better here? I mean, do we have better controls for people building on the cloud uh, to avoid these uh, surprising costs? And this is especially true for banks. Yeah, not, 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 not very nicely kind of surprising costs as well. So that this is still very, um, again, a very nascent area. There's this new term that's come around. And it's funny how these new terms come around, but there's always been good practices in place that this didn't have a nice name, which is FinOps, um, in terms of how you manage for that. Um, and, and it's a very real problem. I mentioned earlier on this kind of franking clouds, the IT operation and cybersecurity risk, but the actual economics, that's where I was referring to, which is you do a bad configuration or you don't clean up your environments thereafter, and you literally can get a tens of millions of dollars uplift from one quarter to the next. That then is very difficult to walk back. Um, the, um, so that's one issue I see. The other issue I see in terms of the financials associated with um, cloud is some of the contracts I see with other general purpose cloud providers look a lot like strategic outsourcing contracts, the old strategic outsourcing where you do fixed price commitments, but you don't have an ability to walk down. Whereas in the old strategic outsourcing contracts, you could actually reduce down or go up. Um, so I, I just find it very interesting that kind of those kind of, kind of contracts get signed when there was a well-trodden way of doing it in an old labor-based way of doing um, contracts relative to what you do now with cloud. Um, but to your question, is it getting any better? Um, it is. We, we partner and have increasing capabilities that we're building because um, we believe it's our responsibility as the platform owner to ensure that we give a duty of care to our customers. Um, and therefore, it's a kind of an architectural philosophy as to how we build. And if I could spend kind of just two minutes on that point on this architectural philosophy. So we have a platform that we provide, and we believe it's our responsibility to build in the laws, rules, and regulations from the outset. We don't believe it's your responsibility. That's unique to IBM. All of the providers do. We believe it's our responsibility to protect you from inadvertent issues that can cause calamitous economic effects if not given properly through the FinOps side. And so why do we have that philosophy? We have it because, of, well, albeit I said we're kind of a two-year-old company and the cloud business is a two-year-old uh, cloud business, we're a 111-year-old uh, business. And we've had a heritage of always believing that whilst technology can be a great enabler, it can have big issues if it's not governed properly. You've seen that in terms of how we think about responsible AI and the very active role that we take in that community. You can see it in quantum computing in terms of that's a very, very powerful capability, but one that can also de-encrypt lots of encryption techniques as it starts to become more powerful and therefore we're leading the way in terms of how companies should think about that. In fact, the four standards that were recently put out by NIST were led by numbers of research functions out of IBM. That's different to the philosophy of more contemporary technology companies where they don't take responsibility for what takes place on the platform. They have shared responsibility models, whatever that means or if there's content on a, um, a company that does kind of, you, you, you can share things with your friends, it's not their responsibility for the content that takes place. Or if there's music or podcasts that go on um, platforms that go out, they don't take responsibility for what that content in is there. That's a very different design philosophy to the design philosophy that IBM does. Um, and therefore to answer that question around FinOps and financials, the answer is we do think more deeply about that as to how you got to have a duty of care to your customers. But that's consistent with all the design principles that we have for everything we have because we take responsibility for the platform. We don't outsource that. We don't shift responsibility back into the customer, which is it's, it's a thing that you've done stuff with. And if you've made a hash of it, it's your fault. And we'll do a press release to say it was your fault or you'll pay the bill because it's, it's, just, it's your responsibility. Very different philosophy. Fantastic. We we are actually at the last sort of seconds of our allocated time with you today, Howard. So I think we need to sort of start wrapping up. But before we do, is, is there any last things you would like to share with with our listeners around, you know, IBM Cloud, IBM FS Cloud, or just generally about the use of cloud and public cloud in the banking industry? 
Yeah, I, I guess that the, the thing I would ask with complete humility is that when you hear the word cloud and you hear the word IBM or whatever else, you will naturally come to a heuristic, a conclusion as to what you think that means. Yeah. And what I would challenge you, and hopefully I have kind of challenge in terms of it isn't what you think it is. So what we have built is very relevant for the marketplace that we're going to. It is complementary to other cloud providers, but specific to the types of workloads that we're going. And it is about delivering the business value that you need to deliver in your role as a CIO, a CTO, a Chief Information Security Officer, whatever your technology capabilities are. Um, and we think about it in a different way, which isn't proprietary just to us. It is absolutely open um, and absolutely open to all the ecosystem partners that we have on, on the, the platform. Um, and therefore, um, I would kind of ask the um, providers the opportunity to share that with you in more detail with the various account teams that we have or reach out for whatever medium you want to, to actually understand more about how we are delivering value for our customers. And that list is increasing all the time with really strong quality use cases from the companies that actually have got to understand what's different about us and how we deliver value, not just about the cloud. And I'm absolutely convinced that there's going to be an awful lot of our listeners that do want to know more and, and want to talk about this in further detail with you, Howard, going forward. So how can they reach you if they want to continue the discussion? Howard Bovill, B-O-V-I-L-L-E, at IBM, best company in the world, dot com. <laughs> the email address is without the best company in the world part in the middle, right? That is correct. But you can have <laughs> Although I actually, I like that. I think we should uh, should try and get our email addresses updated to have best company in the world included in there. It'll be quite good, actually. But it's very humble. Very humble. Very humble. Yes, very humble and to the point. Actually saying that, I just realized we're almost forgetting the joke here. Has anyone got a joke they want to share? I have one. You have? Go for it. Well, actually, it's more of a, anyway, but I mean, Paul, we're on a fintech podcast, right? So yes. we're kind of into this scene. We work in the industry, but have you ever wondered what would happen if we lost interest in banking? No, what would happen? Well, I don't know either, but at least we wouldn't be alone. <laughs> and with that my dear friends and listeners thank you for sticking with us for yet another episode yeah i'll pick up my microphone and drop it um, <laughs> it has been fantastic to talk with you uh howard and um we will be back in two weeks time with another episode uh, another fantastic guest in actual fact i think on the next episode there's a high chance there'll be two guests with us so uh Come around for that one when it happens. But until then, this has been Fintech Daydreaming. This is Fintech Daydreaming.